Hello, welcome to Gemma Network Open Live. I'm Seth Truger, Digital Media Editor at Gemma Network Open. And I'm Angel Desai, Jonathan Fishbeinfellow. Of course, if you're following along live, send us your questions or comments on Twitter at Gemma Network Open, or you can comment in the comment box under the Facebook or YouTube Live uh, videos. So today we've got an interesting paper, the venous thrombosis among critically ill patients with coronavirus disease 2019. And we've got a uh, second author, Tris, uh, Dr. Tristan Marshall Beauchamp with us from Paris. So welcome. Uh, good morning, and um, <laughs> thank you for pronouncing my name so so well. <laughs> so th thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak about this uh, this paper. Um, should I just yeah yeah tell us a little bit. So tell um, us a little about who I'm, you are, why you did this I'm study, an what you found. Intensivist from uh, the Centre Cardiologique du Nord, um, which is a, a hospital in the, in the north of Paris, and. Um, we started to have uh, uh, many patients with uh, severe COVID-19 disease uh, starting from uh, mid-March, um, and now it's starting to uh, to be a, a bit more uh, easy. You know, the number of people uh, with severe disease is uh, getting down. Um, and um, at the beginning of the um, uh, the epidemic in in uh, in Paris, uh, we we had um, uh, news from the intensive care community that. Mm, patient with uh, COVID-19 tended to have um, uh, frequent uh, deep vein thrombosis, and um, uh, there, there was also a very high uh, uh, inflammatory response with these patients, and um, also uh, the uh, blood samples showed a uh, um, elevated, a very uh, high level of uh, D-dimer. So we, um, uh, at the time, there wasn't uh, any papers published um, uh, apart from some uh, case reports. And uh, we started to do a uh, deep vein, uh, uh, searching for deep vein thrombosis uh, on ultrasounds, and our first patients all had uh, deep vein thrombosis. So we um, we decided to uh, assess uh, systematically uh, for all our severe COVID-19 patients um, if they had uh, deep vein thrombosis at admission in uh, our intensive care unit, uh, knowing that all these patients um, sometimes uh, were already uh, in the hospital for a few days, and they all had. Uh, uh, a preventive um, a prophylaxis treatment with uh, usually uh, enoxaparine, uh, 4,000 units per day. Um, and um, we'll talk about uh, the result later, but uh, we had a lot of patients with thrombosis. So we also decided to uh, um, do a second um, a venous Doppler, a venous ultrasound, at 48 hours for the patient who didn't have uh, the event thrombosis at admission to see if uh, thrombosis appeared with uh, prophylactic treatment. Um, so um, we uh, included in this uh, research paper 34 patients. Uh, they were consecutive patients. Uh, all were uh, severe uh, patients. Uh, uh, they were all uh, intubated and ventilated. Um, um, they were all uh, quite um, obese. The uh, mean uh, BMI uh, was around 31. Um, uh, the mean age uh, was around uh, 62. And um, they, uh, for 80, a bit less than 80 percent, all had a, a shock at admission, so they needed uh, norepinephrine. Um, and uh, so we um, uh, we did these uh, dopers. And um, uh, for the, should I talk about the results right now? Or, or? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just um, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we found uh, at around 65 percent uh, of patients had uh, divine thrombosis at admission. Um, and uh, 48 hours after, 15% uh, um, of the population, uh, so five more patients, um, had the vein thrombosis at the second uh, ultrasound exam, uh, despite uh, the standard uh, uh, prophylaxis treatment. So we, and then they all had uh, heparin uh, at uh, uh, anticoagulant doses. Um, for, uh, if you look at the, the results, um, it was 24% uh, initially of uh, proximal uh, thrombosis, and the other was um, uh, calf thrombosis or sub-popliteal thrombosis. Uh, but uh, about 50% of our patients had uh, bilateral thrombosis, and uh, they were all uh, treated with anticoagulant afterwards because they were at uh, high risk uh, of uh, uh, evolving, and we also have all these reports of your uh, association with uh, uh, pulmonary embolism, and uh, uh, so uh, they all that finally uh, heparin treatment for afterwards. Um, 
So that's uh, the results. And um, uh, it's interesting to, to see that uh, for now the guidelines are a bit heterogeneous. Um, uh, the recommendation is to do at least prophylactic treatment with standard dose, but they also recommend some of them to do uh, intermediate dose, like something like 4,000 uh, units of uh, uh, enoxaparin uh, twice a day, or sometimes uh, they recommend for um, patients with a uh, um, uh, high risk, uh, high level of uh, D-dimer to do uh, uh, um, anticoagulant, fuel anticoagulant treatment. Uh, but we are still waiting for uh, um, maybe randomized studies that would be uh, uh, a bit more robust data uh, to, uh, to answer that question. Um, but I think the message here is that uh, I think this patient should all have um, an ultrasound at arrival to, to check if they have a deep vein thrombosis. And uh, my opinion, but I think uh, at least intermediate uh, prof uh, prophylactic treatment should be uh, probably used uh, because we're getting more and more evidence. And there are also other papers uh, that now are published and saying uh, that the, we have a lot of thrombosis in this patient. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been fascinating. I, I think this is this this is uh, you know pretty straightforward research, which is really helpful. I think you know as things are evolving, um, as we're learning more about this new disease, you know this virus didn't exist until about was it six seven months ago, um, and we're certainly you know I think anecdotally have certainly been seeing a lot of uh, clot burden. Um, oh, sorry, I did want to welcome uh, Deep Kawaji has joined us. Welcome. We're talking about DVTs in ICU patients with COVID in France. Um, but, you know. I've, 34 consecutive patients, two-thirds of them had DBTs on admission to the ICU. Another 15% developed DBTs in the ICU who didn't have them initially, despite prophylaxis. I mean, that's just um, shocking. I mean, these were pretty sick patients. I think, you know, mm -hmm. your, the way you describe the patients, I think, are pretty representative of, of how sick the patients are that, that get to the ICU with coronavirus. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I think, uh, if nothing else, you know, it's not just further research is needed, but, uh, you know, I think there, there's absolutely... Uh, worth studying, if not considering systematic anticoagulation or full mm -hmm. anticoagulation for the, at least the critically ill patients. I think there are m m even one um, um, trial in the U.S. that's starting with um, um, uh, thromboly uh, thrombolysis uh, treatment for all patients, uh, all severe patients. So we'll see what will be the results. And okay. I'm pretty sure there are also trials with uh, uh, fuel anticoagulation treatment uh, running right now. Right now. Sure. Going to welcome uh, Drew Kay has joined us as well. And then we also have a reader question. Um, are you using vit IV vitamin C in any patients in the ICU right now? Um, no, not in our ICU. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I, nah, <laughs> there's not a lot of data on that for now. But <laughs> Right. Yeah, I think there, were, there, were, there was a promising case series in general sepsis a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, and then I think at least two negative trials since then that I know mm -hmm. about um, with... Uh, like more secondary outcomes than patients showing benefit, as far as I know, <laughs> from mm -hmm. Um Now, did any, so I think after 48 hours, you said that 79% of um, patients mm -hmm. in the ICU developed PVT. Now, did anybody, I don't know if you followed the patients past 48 hours, did anybody, and, uh, you know, the, those that were left, did they go on? Yes, um, uh, it's not in the paper, of course, but um, um, we uh, we did the uh, controls of uh, all the patients and with uh, uh, fuel dose anticoagulant treatment, all uh, the thrombosis uh, uh, disappeared almost. Um, uh, most of the patient, um, when they uh, got out of the intensive care unit, didn't have any more uh, thrombosis uh, after. I don't know. Maybe the mean stay was. Maybe a bit more, than, a bit, bit less than a month, maybe uh, for the severe patient. Um, but so it's working, and uh, it's also probably the um, disease itself that uh, the inflammatory response gets lower, and maybe uh, people get uh, get better with that. Yeah, you know, one of the things that's been interesting to me in the ER is, um, you know, we have these patients who are short of breath uh, early on, especially since we know a lot of the testing, um, mm -hmm. you know, the testing isn't perfectly sensitive. So we end up in a lot of gray areas and the mm -hmm. question about whether to order deep dimers for potential PE. Um, and in some ways, it's almost squirreled, squared the circle because one, if the D-dimer is positive and we end up deciding it's COVID, we know the D-dimer is up from COVID. And two, we're finding venous thromboembolism in COVID. So it almost... Uh, instead of being in a situation where we don't want to scan patients, it almost adds more justification to scanning patients. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm curious where, you know, the ICU is a little different and it can be a lot harder to do CT pulmonary angiography. Have you, were you, do you have any idea on the rates of your PEs in these um, patients? Not really, because we didn't do a systematic uh, injected uh, IV CT scan. Uh, I know of a paper who recently published who said that there was 23% of uh, pulmonary embolism uh, in these patients. Uh, we also, uh, but however, we did a systematic uh, uh, echocardiography uh, for all these patients, and we had very few um, cor corp pulmonal. So mm -hmm. if they had pulmonary embolism is possible, but not uh, very severe and uh, with an uh, impact on the right uh, uh, so, okay. But we don't have the, the figure for uh, pulmonary embolism. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard. I mean, like like uh, like you said, you know, these patients, all, you know, just getting CTs mm. on normal uh, ICU patients mm. is hard enough, but a lot of these patients mm. are in ECMO, yeah. um, which folds into a good reader question. Um, are you seeing higher rates of thrombotic complications in the ECMO patients than normal? Um, well, uh, we had 10 ECMO patients uh, in our unit, um, and um, uh, we don't have, uh, didn't have a lot of um, thrombosis because they were all uh, at, at full dose anticoagulant treatment. Uh, so that's probably why, and the membrane didn't, there was no, not a lot of thrombosis in the, in the ECMO membrane. Uh, and um, yeah, we, we, and we had good results with the, the ECMO patients. Um, most of them went out of ECMO after about uh, uh, 10 to 15 days, usually. Um, and uh, and the, um, we had, however, um, on the uh, insertion side, sometimes we had uh, thrombosis, uh, hmm. but uh, after taking out the ECMO, but uh, with no impact on the of the patient. And now, um, now I'm sorry, uh, Seth, that I interrupted. No, <laughs> <laughs> and now that the uh, even though sort of the study is over, do you continue to um, uh, obtain ultrasounds on all patients with COVID? Yeah. Mm, um, in fact, we're continuing to do the ultrasounds and. Uh, we also um, uh, want to have a um, larger database of uh, um, coagulation uh, uh, markers and maybe we'll find something because um, our, we didn't have, um, uh, for this first paper, a uh, big enough uh, cohort of patients to to uh, redo um, uh, statistical, uh, to see statistical difference between uh, uh, the two population in terms of uh, uh, D-dimer, etc. So there was tendency to, to be different, but I think the sample was too, too small for that. So um, maybe a next paper. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, this is, this is really great work. It's really important. Thank you so much, both for the thank research and the, and the clinical work you're doing, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Goodbye. Yes, sir. Great. I'll take care. Um, all right, Angel, what do we have next? All right, so um, this is comparison of clinical characteristics of patients with asymptomatic versus symptomatic coronavirus disease 2019 in Wuhan, China. This is a research letter from Yang and colleagues. And um, it was a case, case series, rather, that um, whose aim it was to describe clinical characteristics of patients with SARS-CoV-2 that was confirmed by PCR um, from 26 transmit transmission cluster cases. So these were actually 78 patients that were related to 26 cluster cases, either through direct exposure to um, Hunan seafood market or by close contact with other patients um, that had COVID-19. Um, so as I mentioned, these patients were confirmed to have COVID-19 by PCR. Um, they found, the authors found that the median number of patients per cluster was three, but that that range was anywhere from two to 10, which I thought was kind of interesting. 42% um, of the patients um, ended up being asymptomatic or were asymptomatic. 57% were symptomatic. Those that were asymptomatic um, yet also had confirmed disease um, or confirmed infection, I should say, tended to be younger, female, um, had a sh and had a shorter duration of uh, viral shedding from NP swabs, um, along with some other um, interesting kind of clinical characteristics that are in the paper. Um, and I should mention that, you know, something that I thought was interesting and the authors sort of make note of in their conclusion is that, um, yes, there was a shorter duration of viral shedding in among the patients that were asymptomatic, but they were still shedding. So um, that's sort of just, you know, again, from a sort of transmission, infection, and prevention perspective, um, sort of something to take note of. Yeah, I, th I thought this was fascinating. I mean, it's, I think, so hard to try to compare symptomatic to asymptomatic patients, yeah. um, and you, I'm sure, can't capture all the asymptomatic patients. Um, 
but even then, I think it's kind of at least um, all this seems plausible and makes sense that there's less liver injury, there's less lipopenia, there's faster recovery on imaging, less shedding. Um, uh, so I don't know. It's 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 uh, you know as we're learning more and more, especially about asymptomatic spread, and hopefully as we get things under control, uh, this this will be some important lessons. Um, yeah. but oh, Jennifer White has joined us. Welcome. Um, and I think you've got the next paper as well, right? <laughs> I do. Yes. So this is mental health outcomes among frontline and second line healthcare workers during the coronavirus disease 2019 COVID 19 uh, COVID 19 pandemic in Italy. So this is a research letter from Rossi and colleagues. It's a cross-sectional study that used online questionnaires to try to report on mental health outcomes among healthcare workers in Italy. Um, so the sampling period preceded the COVID-19 peak in Italy. Um, they ended up having about a little more than 1,300 healthcare workers that completed the questionnaire. 49% uh, of those that um, uh, completed the questionnaire endorsed post-traumatic stress symptoms. 24% endorsed symptoms of depression, 18% endorsed symptoms of anxiety, 8% insomnia, and 21% had high um, levels of perceived stress. And recall, these are all healthcare workers. Um, there were a lot of other associations that were investigated, and this is in the accompanying tables, um, in the research letter accompanying table, I should say. Um, and, you know, just as a note, I think these findings are sort of in line with, um, I think we actually talked about it, a study from China that looked at similar sort of, um, you know, mental health outcomes among healthcare workers under this um, sort of extraordinary uh, prolonged event or events. Yeah, I thought, again, yeah, this is a little bit of, I'd say, uh, a nice replication study, um, you know, especially watching the, um, you know, the pandemic spread, unfortunately, yeah. as it does, uh, you know, what the experience is in China versus uh, Italy versus I'm sure what we'll see in the U.S., uh, and, and, you know, different even within different places in the U.S. because, you know, the pandemic, you know, like, from what I hear from, you know, Chicago versus New York is so is so starkly different. And, um, uh, you know, versus Italy versus places that haven't been hit as hard. Um, yeah. It's It's been so different. Um, yeah. I think what. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I was just going to say that, you know, these rates are pretty high. You know, it's a half of people had PTSD type syndromes. Um, I was actually really surprised that only 8 percent had insomnia. Um, I know. That almost yeah. seems like it went down from normal times. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right. Well, people are working a lot. So, yeah. um, yeah. you know, I, the one thing I wanted to just mention, I think this was um, mentioned in the paper from China, <clears throat> that um, uh, when mental health outcomes had been looked at among healthcare workers after the SARS um, uh, epidemic in China, uh, a lot of these sort of um, symptoms actually persisted for several years after, um, even after the sort of uh, epidemic had ended. And so I think that will definitely be something that we need to think about moving forward in terms of, um, you know, supporting our healthcare workers that have been working on the front line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And uh, Samantha Rusamagna has joined us. Welcome. Um, we were talking about a couple COVID papers, just finishing up on one on um, mental health in healthcare workers in um, Italy during the pandemic. Um, but yeah, it's been really interesting. I think I might've mentioned this a while ago, but um, back in 2010, when I was a, um, a resident, uh, I looked into, I was rotating at ABC News uh, and looked into, it was during the, um, the Gulf oil spill and mm -hmm. was looking into the health effects and all the best data was for mental health. And I think there's just, uh, the psychiatrists are really good at doing these kinds of studies during and after disasters mm -hmm. um, and really showing what the burden is. Um, and, um, you know, it's just a tough, important stuff, especially, you know, not only, am I, you know, for selfish reasons as a healthcare worker, but just, you know, as a citizen who might need to be a consumer of healthcare at some point, um, it's, it's important stuff to make sure that we have a robust health system, especially since, you know, one of the potential dangers of the pandemic is the health system being overwhelmed. Yeah. If their workforce is devastated, that makes it, uh, you know, it's a double hit. Yeah. Um, so that positive note, uh, Matthew Legrand has joined us. Welcome. I'm using all of my French knowledge from seven years, despite it being terrible. Um, and we're moving on to our last paper. So this is an interesting one, another research letter, the assessment of the qualitative fit test and quantitative single pass filtration efficiency of disposable N95 masks following gamma irradiation by Kramer and colleagues. Um, so this is an interesting paper. So they looked at uh, three different height types of, of N95 respirators made by 3M. Uh, including the ones that we're using now, which are, there's not there's like white hemispheric kind of um, construction-y ones, which mm -hmm. uh, work and I'm very happy to have, but are, are, are very tough to work with for extended periods of time. Um, and they uh, they irradiated them using the Gamma Cell 220E Cobalt 60 irradiator, 
um, which based on my Googling earlier today is just kind of used for, um, for cleaning medical supplies along with some other, uh, some other basically industrial and commercial uses. Um, the idea is using, um, gamma irradiation uh, to kill microbes um, so you can reuse what's uh, so reuse medical supplies they did a, a couple masks um, at, uh, let's see at, at, they did a uh, control and then one 10 and 50 kilograys um, at 1.3 uh, mega electron volts of gamma radiation at a dose rate of 2.2 kilogray per hour um, then they had one doc who did blinded fit tests on all of them uh, you know, the same kind of qualitative fit tests we do, uh, you know, every year at work, uh, you know, we put on the mask, they put the hood on you, you spray the saccharin or arbuterol, whatever you're using. Um, then they also did a filtration test where they, um, they basically used like an air duct system to do a single pass of 0.3 microns, 0.5 microns and one microns. Um, and the 95 to 95 means it's supposed to block 95% of any of air particles that are 0.3 microns or larger. Um, the good news is that basically all the qualitative tests passed, so the actual like kind of macro fit of the mask on the face wasn't affected uh, in any bad way. But unfortunately, if you look at the figure, you can see uh, that the gamma radiation did degrade the mask's filtration capabilities. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you if basically as you look across, even even the largest particles, the one microns, uh, at all three doses, degraded a fair amount. And you can see, you know, the control is right around the 90, 95 percent. Um, but the the any amount of radiation really uh, you know cut down a substantial amount of the filtering capability. Um, and Ragi Murrigan has joined us. Welcome. Apologies again for my pronunciation. Um, you know, and they didn't. I don't think they tested. They didn't do any sort of test to see if the um, if any virus was killed. These were these, this is all lab testing. Yeah. Um, so so you know that basically the, the you know as with. You know, pretty much any FDA thing, there's a safety question, the efficacy question. And this is kind of the safety question is, does the mask still work after you clean it? Not answering whether or not it actually cleans it well. Although I, I would imagine, I don't know. I don't know much about radiation, but this sounds like a ton. Yeah, gamma radiation, it does sound like a ton. I yeah. agree. I guess like the other question that I had is, you know, I'm assuming these were brand new masks. So, mm-hmm. um, and I would imagine that the point of this would be so that you can kind of hopefully continue to use a mask after it's been used a while. So that would be another question, I think, for me. Um, yep. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I think when it comes to this, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on, uh, you know, reusable PPE and how to assess it. But I guess my mindset would be if I had to make something up would be, uh, you know, it needs to fit, it needs to filter, it needs to kill the virus, uh, it needs it needs to not have degraded just from the normal use. Um, and if any of those don't work, then you can't really reuse them. And this one didn't work. Um, so unfortunately, uh, not a magic bullet for us. Um, which is too bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the good news is so far, I think it looks like most of the overall trends are going down. And, uh, but I think unfortunately a lot of us are bracing for a second or continued wave. Yeah. Um, and I don't think the protests we're seeing in Chicago are going to be, and, and around the country and the world are, are going to be helpful as far as uh, tamping down the wave, just as we're about to start loosening things up. <laughs> so again, sorry to end on a negative note. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Um, but, uh, but thank you for joining us. You can get these paper and more, uh, for free and open access at JAMA network.com every weekday. We've got new papers coming out at 10 a.m. Central time. Join us next week, Tuesday, June 9th at 3 p.m. Central time. Um, and of course, follow us on all your social media channels and get the, uh, audio of the author interview on our podcast on iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, be safe. Take care. Bye.